I'm from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. I'm a medical anthropologist by training, which means that um, while I know my way around the corner of the sandbox that involves uh, scientific interventions and evaluation and epidemiology and all those things, what really interests me and what I've spent a lot of time working on is how human beings interact with things like drugs, make choices, interact with healthcare systems, and how we can build stuff um, that actually helps more people. So basically, the folks that design the iPhone that are super interested in how you interact with its icons and its apps. I do that, but with opioids, if that makes sense, right? Um, so the first thing that I want to talk to you about, just real briefly, is what an opioid actually is. Um, it is it's got a kind of circular definition. Um, an opioid is something that interacts with um, a part of your brain that's called an opioid receptor. So they have the same name because they interact with each other. It's a lot more complicated than that um, in, on a, a molecular level. And if you have more questions about that, Matt, Matt Gendel's your dude. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, on a, because a lot of different things interact with opioid receptors on lots of different levels. And they're all a little bit different. And it's super fascinating. And you can take what class is it in the spring? Uh, Psy 350. Psy 350, to learn all about that. I'm, you better believe I'm going to be sitting in the back taking notes. Um, but uh, opioids that you may have come across, they have a whole bunch of different names. Um, morphine is the sort of classic uh, opioid that comes, um, or opiate, meaning, meaning it's organic, that comes from the, um, the poppy plant. Um, heroin. Um, I've mentioned that it's called diacetyl morphine because heroin and morphine are really, really similar. They're almost exactly the same molecule. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Um, oxycodone, brand name oxycontin, hydrocodone, brand name Vicodin, codeine, methadone, fentanyl, Percocet. Um, these are all things that are technically opioids, even though they have a whole bunch of different generic and, and brand names. Okay. Um, so opioid use disorder is a really specific thing. Um, it's not just using drugs or using drugs problematically. It's actually a very specific clinical diagnosis, right? So it is a, a medical and biological disorder. It has a behavioral component, but there really are very clear and defined biological things that happen as well. Um, about 15% of people in America will uh, meet the clinical criteria for addiction at some point in their lives. And that's not necessarily a use disorder with opioids. It could be with alcohol, uh, with tobacco, with cocaine, with lots of other things around which humans can develop um, substance use disorders. But I, I throw that up there to indicate that it's actually something that a lot of us deal with on a number of different levels. And specifically, it's characterized by two major things. Um, if you go into the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, the DSM, or the all sorts of other places where we code uh, what specific diseases are, create case definitions, you'll see symptoms that, that are um, more detailed than this. But the two biggest things are, are this, a physical dependence on opioids, which means that the more you take them into your system, the angrier your body gets when you don't continue getting them. So that means, um, A, your tolerance goes going up, which means that to get the same kind of pain relief, the same kind of euphoria, or anything that you were experienced before, you need more of them. And it means that if you get less of them, you start getting withdrawal symptoms. And those can vary a little bit from person to person, but they often uh, overlap with really strong flu symptoms or really strong food poisoning symptoms, things like that. So not the most fun in the world. Um, and it also um, uh, is defined by compulsive drug use and drug seeking despite the harmful consequences. And that's something that I think is, is important to, to point out, that we can be engaged in problematic behaviors without uh, coming to the point where if things are just really going bad and it's going to hurt us on multiple levels, our relationship, our ability to do our jobs, our personal health, um, and we can decide it's no longer worth it and stop, that's, we haven't quite got to the use disorder problem yet. Now, this chart that I have to the left, um, I wanted to point out uh, specifically how different the numbers are between people who are engaging in opioid use and people who meet the clinical criteria for opioid use disorder. Um, there is a myth. I was definitely told growing up that heroin is like so addictive and if you use it once you'll be hooked forever and that's absolutely not true. Um, it actually takes a little bit of work to develop a heroin addiction um, or to any kind of opioid. You have to be on it for quite a few weeks. And this is, these are numbers from 2015 from a national survey that was conducted by SAMHSA, the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, uh, Services Administration, part of the U.S. government. Um, I particularly want to point out how, how low the, the percentages are for people who have engaged in pain reliever misuse um, and also people who have used heroin in the last year versus developed a past year disorder. 
Um, I, I want to point out also that there's a lot of people, myself included, who have taken a bit of exception to the way that SAMHSA has defined use disorder um, in these particular surveys. Sometimes they, they clump in problematic use, which is more than saying, which is, which is uh, I guess, a broader category than opioid use disorder. And so if we're going to look at only the people who have ever used heroin and how many people among those actually develop an opioid use disorder, oh. Yeah, that got moved. Um, but uh, the, according to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, it's mostly about 23%. <coughs> so only about one in four, one in five people who ever use heroin ever end up developing heroin use disorder. Um, there is a natural progression to opioid use disorder. Um, one thing that we commonly see is this uh, pattern of behavior where someone starts using it recreationally because they're getting something out of it, it feels good, it's relieving their pain, um, it's, it's, uh, they're self-medicating certain symptoms, or they're just partying and having a good time. Um, once you start developing that tolerance and, and building up that dependency on the drug, more and more people will start using it to feel normal again. And then, and then once your use disorder gets more severe, people will start using it in order to feel well. Right? So, so basically using to stave off those particular withdrawal symptoms. Um, the reason why this occurs in some people and not everyone is still something that we're coming to understand, but it doesn't happen in everyone. We know that about 40 to 60% of your risk for developing a use disorder is genetic. So there is something to that. Um, we also know that you need environmental exposure, right? So if you live um, on a kibbutz somewhere where you don't even have dairy, let alone tobacco or alcohol or heroin, probably not going to develop a heroin use disorder, right? So it needs to be something that you're able to be exposed to. Maybe people around you are doing it. You learn how to use it. We do know that brain changes occur, right? That reward pathways alter a little bit. And, and that also, because of how your body has developed tolerance, you go through withdrawal when you don't have it. It's really, really hard to overestimate how compelling that is. Pain sucks. And we will often do a lot of things to try to get out of pain. And then the most important part, uh, I think, that's worth taking away, if you remember one thing from this presentation, remember this, and that's opioid use disorder is characterized by cycles of recurrence and remission, right? Which means that it's a long-term thing that people go through, and they do better, and then worse, and then better, and then worse. Um, it's kind of a silly metaphor, but I've often compared it to, like, losing weight. Right? But we've all gone through periods where you're like, I am going to fit into that size six dress, and maybe you managed to bust your bum and you did, and then like the next season you're a size 10. And I know that I bounce back and forth, and I definitely have pants that range from an 8 to a 14 in my closet because such is life. Right? So, in the same way that we kind of can move back and forth in all of our own uh, behaviors when it comes to exercising, regulating our sleep, eating well, you know, trying not to stress relief with, with chocolate cake, things like that, people can also move in and out of healthier and less healthy patterns with opioid use disorder over time. And that's really, really normal, right? We set people up for failure and disappointment when we tell them that that's not how it's going to work. So that brings us to this question, right? Does tough love for people with opioid use disorder work? Um, this is something that I have seen a lot of people talk about, um, and it is, <coughs> a tactic that I've seen a lot of people in my personal community and my personal life use, because if you have someone that you love who's kind of losing control of what's going on around them and putting themselves at risk or maybe putting others at risk, um, it's very, very tempting to want to regain control of that situation, right? That's the anthropologist in me who is like, we have to gain control of the story and what's happening, and, and that's how humans interact with stress and fear, is to try to regain control, right? The problem is, if this is a disorder, that is defined by constantly going back to something in spite of harmful consequences, harmful consequences aren't going to stop people from going back, right? So ultimately, this kind of punitive approach um, or helping someone hit rock bottom doesn't really get us anywhere. Fortunately, we have things that do work really, really well, right? Um, and uh, and I, I wanted to mention this specifically because I know a lot of people that I talk to, you guys might have heard about this before. This might be something you're familiar with. Maybe um, a friend or a teacher or some other class you're in has talked about it. But very few people, especially adults that I know, are aware of how effective medications are at treating opioid use disorder. And those medications, there's currently three FDA-approved medications. Um, you'll have heard their names. Methadone is one. Right. Um, the second one, uh, which is, 
I guess the, the sophomore release for uh, opioid use disorder medications is called buprenorphine. Um, it's a <laughs> word that no spell check I've ever used has ever been able to, to get quite right. Um, but it's sold under the brand name Subutex or Suboxone. Um, and then the third one is Naltrexone. And if you by any chance live somewhere in New England or in the Boston area, if you've gone home, you've probably seen ads for Naltrexone on the T in a lot of different stations. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're pushing it. Re they really want you to buy Naltrexone. Oh my gosh. Um, so these aren't the same drug, right? They're not all appropriate for everybody. Every human is different. Every physical body is different. Every opioid use disorder is a little bit different. Um, but we do know that these drugs really help people stay stable. They really are effective at preventing death. That's the thing that I find super, super compelling, right? And so this is a chart that is actually from uh, Baltimore, but it's true on so many scales. The red line is the number of heroin overdoses that were being experienced in the area. Um, the dotted line is buprenorphine patients. And, and as I mentioned, that became available um, more, more recently than methadone, so it only started around 2002 or <coughs> three. Um, and then the sort of hashy line up at the top is methadone patients. And we can see clearly that as more people are accessing these drugs, the fewer people are dying from the disease that the drug treats, right? We see similar charts when we start actually treating um, HIV. Like once treatments actually become available that work, the number of people that are dying of late stage HIV disease or advanced AIDS just starts to plummet, right? So this is a pattern that we see when things actually work. The challenge is, is that a lot of folks um, grow up with this idea that being clean is what's really the thing that should be sought after. Um, again, as an anthropologist, I'm like, well, what does clean mean? And who gets to define what clean is and what was dirty? Was it you? Was it the drug? Uh, it's a narrative, right? But the narrative actually doesn't really hold up to scientific scrutiny. We're told that narrative a lot. And I don't know if you guys are watching season 14 of Grey's Anatomy, but I want to throw my shoe at the screen like every single time they take that teenager to another NA meeting. I'm like, just give her medication. You're a doctor. Um, but, uh, but this stuff is really, really effective. The problem is it can be sometimes kind of hard to um, to access for a lot of different reasons, but it's very, very effective. And here's part of the reason uh, why it's particularly effective for treating this long-term disorder. Okay? Um, on the left is uh, the way in which people tend to present symptoms of hypertension or high blood pressure. Right? So before they get on treatment, their symptoms are really strong, blood pressure all over the place, experiencing all the symptoms and health risks of that. Once they're on treatment, things kind of stabilize and it manages to, to keep them at a stable level. After treatment, things aren't as bad as they were, but they still can get worse. And it's the same with opioid use disorder, right? So medications, methadones, buprenorphines, suboxones are not things that you kind of go on like antibiotics on for two weeks, off for two weeks. It's a long-term thing because you're now living in a body that has this really strongly developed opioid dependence and you can be on methadone and on buprenorphine for a really long time and be very healthy, very happy, very safe, very free from risk of death and overdose. In fact, buprenorphine is the gold standard right now of treatment for pregnant women with opioid use disorder. Right? Super, super safe, but takes a long period of time. Speaking of relapse and cycles of recurrence, um, this is from the same JAMA article. Um, but if we look at the rates of what we call relapse or recurrence of symptoms in people who are um, being treated for type 1 diabetes, we see that relapse and recurrence in about 30 to 50 percent of people. In hypertension and in asthma, it's 50 to 70 percent. I have asthma, so I am living proof that this is real, right? And with substance use disorders, it's somewhere in between. So it's really very, very similar the way it presents to so many other chronic diseases. It's just as treatable as other chronic diseases, but we have these social narratives that tell us otherwise. Overdoses are something that a lot of people are experiencing. I've actually spent a lot of time doing ethnography in hospitals and ERs, talking to people after they have experienced an accidental overdose and thankfully gotten there. Someone called 911. There was a response. Their, their overdose was reversed and now they're fine, right? And about half of those people who were in there were really, um, I would call them regular users, whether or not they actually have an opioid use disorder or something a doctor would have to diagnose properly um, and assess what, what sort of services or treatments best for them. But about half the people are what public health folks call intermittent users, right? So folks who 
decided to go to a party on the weekend and had something offered to them. Um, someone who was like, wow, I haven't used heroin since the 80s, but it just seemed like that kind of Friday, so I was going to do it. Or someone who was like, that is the last time I tell Jeremy he knows how to treat my migraine. You know, it's all, all sorts of things that have people who aren't really familiar with these drugs interacting with them and then having something happen. So part of the reason why overdoses happen is because opioids depress the central nervous system, right? That means it takes all of the things that, that downregulate in your body, that like slow your heart rate down or slow your breathing down, maybe after you've trucked up a flight of stairs or something that settles you back down, and it really, really pumps up their ability to do that. So it's super turning down your heart rate, super turning down your respiratory rate, things like that. Um, a, a short way or a metaphorical way to put it is that it turns off the parts of your brain that give you anxiety which is one of those reasons why people might turn to heroin if they don't have a really good access to mental health care. So that can be a short-term gain. But then slightly longer than short-term and even long-term, it can turn down the parts of your brain that keep you awake and then turn down the parts of the brain that keep you breathing. And you're not awake to be like, oh no, I'm not breathing. Okay. So that's how overdoses tend to happen. And so overall, those overdoses happen when those vital brain functions slow down so much that you're not breathing at all and not pulling in enough oxygen. Right. So how much is too much? How does one get to the point of accidentally overdosing? Right. Because I, I would be willing to believe that the vast majority of you have sprained an ankle, broken an arm, has your, had your wisdom teeth out, had some Vicodin from your doctor, took it to relieve pain, and you went on with your life and were perfectly fine. Right. So how do we go from that to a place where someone's actually at risk of death? Well, the first question is how strong are the opioids in your body? I gave you a list of names that you might recognize either from street drugs or prescription drugs, things like that at the beginning. Those aren't the same molecules at all. And in fact, opioids can be 100 times stronger or weaker than each other. And, and also the strength of those opioids can vary based on how you put it in your body. Are you snorting it? Are you injecting it? Are you transdermally um, taking it in like through a fentanyl patch? Um, all sorts of things. So it really, 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 really varies. Um, the other question is how low is your opioid tolerance, right? So one person's this isn't too strong of a dose isn't someone else's this isn't too strong of a dose, right? So even if you used to take opioids a lot, so if we have someone who was engaging in opioid misuse or recreational opioid use a lot, if you stop for a while, your tolerance can drop a ton. And so when you use again, even if you're being kind of cautious, it can still be too much for your body because you don't really know where your levels are, right? And this is something that we've actually seen happen to a lot of people. We know this was the cause behind Demi Lovato's overdose, Corey Monteith's overdose. A lot of people had a habit, slowed down, went through treatment, relapsed, and then their tolerance was down. And even if they were trying to be careful, it was just too much for their bodies at that one time. Okay, um, and then also, do you have other central nervous system depressants in your body? And this is a one big thing that a lot of people don't know, that even though alcohol is not an opioid, benzodiazepines are not an opioid, Valium is not an opioid, they still turn down all those things in your brain the same way, right? So if you are at a party and are on your sixth beer, and then someone offers you a Percocet, that's basically like 10, beers, right? Or, or it's, it, you're basically stacking these things onto each other. So they're not having separate effects on your brain. They're all having the same effect. And the vast majority of fatal overdoses in this country aren't from heroin alone, aren't from opioids alone. They're from opioids with something else. Opioids with alcohol, opioids with benzodiazepines, um, that's stuff like Ativan, Diazepam, Clonopin, Xanax, um, with sedatives, Ambien, Sonata, Lunestra, Phenobarbital. So stacking those things can be really, really dangerous, right? Um, there are plenty of people in this world who are on things like methadone and buprenorphine plus an anti-anxiety med like an Ativan or diazepam under doctor supervision, but even that makes clinicians a little nervous, right? Lots of long meetings I've sat in about how to manage the risk of different people that need all these medications. So stacking them is really, really ups your overdose risk. But there is good news. Since the 60s, I believe, maybe even the 50s, we have had this uh, medication called naloxone, which I have scattered across the table in my favorite kind of centerpiece. Um, and it's a drug that reverses opioid overdoses. It's basically magic. It's science magic. It's my favorite kind of magic. So the way it works, real briefly, is it, um, it essentially blocks the opioids from acting in your body, right? Um, it's something that's super benign. Uh, so if it were not super expensive and possibly life-saving for someone else later on, you could inject it in me right now and I would say, ow, and then I would go throughout the rest of my day with no effects, right? So it's, it doesn't um, cause any sort of dependence. It doesn't um, have any sort of uh, euphoria or, or um, 
uh, dependence risk or anything like that. It's just a, a really, really benign drug that's super good at, at turning off the opiates in your body or blocking them from interacting with your brain. So there's a few different um, ways that it is made available. In order from least expensive to most expensive, the least expensive stuff is this liquid that you inject into someone's muscle. And I have this because this is the kind that is distributed by local needle exchanges. Yes, every single syringe exchange in North Carolina passes this stuff out and they can train you how to use it. It comes with some syringes. If you're diabetic, if you're someone who has allergy shots or if you um, have a history of injection and you are comfortable with syringes, this is probably the way to go because you know your way around that, right? Um, these uh, aren't too, too expensive. We also have this, the Afrin spray of naloxone, which is super easy. It's more expensive because capitalism. Um, but it's the exact same drug, works the exact same way, and you literally just shove it up someone's nose. This stuff you can actually buy over the counter at CVS or Walgreens. Um, it's not cheap, but your health insurance might cover it. And if your health insurance won't cover it when you just show up and say, I want this, your doctor might be able to prescribe it for you. Right? Um, there's a third way that is basically uh, an auto injector, like an EpiPen that talks to you. Um, it's super cool. You like pull out the tab and it's all like, someone is overdosing. Do not panic. Put this on their thigh. Call 911. It works really well. I've seen people um, or talked to people who have used it uh, after an overdose and they had no training whatsoever. And they were like, they totally walked me through it and now my boyfriend is fine. Right? Those things cost more than my car because capitalism, but you can have them prescribed to you and they are around, um, they're pretty, pretty easy to get. So as I said before, naloxone essentially blocks those opioid receptors, right? So it sits really, really, really hard and hangs on tight to the same receptors that opioids are trying to activate in your brain to turn down all of those central nervous system activities of like staying awake, breathing, heart beating, all that sort of stuff. And it just sits on there and doesn't do anything. So you can think of it like an opioid receptor condom in a way, right? It doesn't stay in your body exactly as long as the opioids, but it's usually enough to help you get through the hump while your liver is sort of pulling everything out of your body. It's really, really, really effective. And I wanna make you aware uh, that Elon University Police, Burlington Police, every single ambulance ever, um, hospitals and ERs and most fire departments carry naloxone, right? Um, you can get some from your doctor by prescription, any commercial pharmacy or any North Carolina syringe exchange, right? And, and just keep it in the back of your minds. I know some of the folks that are going after me are going to mention this, um, but really strong opiates for reasons that we're not really clear about, and I'm studying as fast as I can, but I'm just one person. Um, fentanyl, a really, really strong synthetic opioid, is turning up in cocaine supplies in the US. It's definitely in some cocaine supplies in North Carolina, right? So even if snorting Percocets on the weekend is not your jam, which is, not something I recommend because there's a lot of Tylenol in there and that will hurt you. Um, cocaine can lead to an opioid overdose if there's opioids in the cocaine, right? So the same way that you were taught in Girl Scouts, if you get a tick bite, just keep it in the back of your mind. If you start having fatigue six months later, you might have Lyme disease and mention that to your doctor. If you or anyone you know is interacting with cocaine or a drug in which opioids have no business being there, and then someone loses consciousness and has trouble breathing, keep that in the back of your mind. There's a non-zero possibility it might be an opioid overdose, and all of these folks carry it and are minutes away from you. I'm around to answer any questions after the fact as well. Um, and like I said, I, as Carmen mentioned, I'm in the sociology department. I'm the only Jennifer there. If you have any questions, please come hunt me down. I'm happy to talk to you. So my position as a Haida public health analyst for the state supports three of the seven strategies, including creating a coordinated infrastructure, reducing diversion and flow of illicit drugs, and increasing community awareness. So Haida, as was mentioned earlier, stands for the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program. It is a national program that provides assistance to federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies operating in areas determined to be critical drug trafficking regions. The opioid response strategy is an initiative currently being implemented in 22 of the Haida states. The overall goal of this initiative is to reduce non-fatal and fatal overdose incidents by developing and sharing information about heroin and other opioids across agencies. This ties in with creating a coordinated infrastructure of the state action plan. The Haida program has also has hired a public health analyst as well as a drug intelligence officer that work collaboratively to increase interagency communication, data flow, and intelligence sharing. 
As the public health analyst, I am also expected to enhance opioid overdose reporting and to develop and disseminate reports on trends, which aligns with our state strategy of increasing community awareness. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you one of the reports that we've started disseminating. So in North Carolina, we're really lucky to have very timely and accessible emergency department data. This has allowed us to develop monthly opioid overdose emergency department reports. This is an example of the report um, that was disseminated last month. And on this first page, all we're looking at is some um, year-to-date trends of and how that compares to the previous year. And then the second page of, of that report shows a monthly overview of rates of overdose emergency department visits, and then as well as some demographic information. Another action plan strategy is to increase the availability of naloxone. Naloxone is the life-saving opioid overdose reversal drug. So for this strategy, we partner with North Carolina's Harm Reduction Coalition. They implement harm reduction strategies such as distributing overdose rescue kits. Since August of 2013, they have distributed 80,000 kits. And as, as of October 1st of this year, there have been 12,000 overdose reversals reported. So the darker shaded counties on this map show more re um, reversals being reported. Another statewide strategy is to expand treatment access and recovery support. Syringe exchange programs are one of the most effective public health interventions for decreasing the transmission rates of HIV and other bloodborne diseases such as hepatitis C. It is also a way of connecting users to treatment. While it is, common, while it is a common myth that syringe exchange programs encourage or enable drug use, decades of research show that syringe exchange programs do none of those. In fact, many studies demonstrate that syringe exchange programs decrease drug use by connecting otherwise marginalized people to treatment. It is estimated that syringe exchange programs participants are five times more likely to enter drug treatment than non-participants. So this map is showing counties with syringe exchange programs in North Carolina. We, we currently have 32, 32 active programs serving 38 North Carolina counties. So I've listed a few ways we're addressing the opioid action plan, um, but how do we know if we're making an impact? So the state has proposed to follow 13 metrics and has also developed a dashboard to track these metrics. So I know this is probably difficult to read, but here we have listed the 13 metrics and they are divided into five overall goals. For example, reducing opioid related deaths and ED visits, by which we are measuring or tracking the number of deaths and the number of ED visits. Another example is increasing access to naloxone, by which we are tracking the number of EMS naloxone administrations, as well as the number of community naloxone reversals. So this is actually a screenshot of our opioid uh, dashboard. Um, and in this example, I've selected Guilford because I mistakenly thought that Elon was at Guilford. But this is an example of Elon. And here on the left of the dashboard, we've selected the metric of reducing death and ED visits. And each metric page has a, a graph and a map. Here we have a graph of unintentional opioid deaths with a smoothed trend line. And then on the right, we have a map of debt data for the last available quarter. So you're able to go to this website page and then see each metric and compare the graph as well as how the county looks like compared to the rest of the state. So I've mentioned a few reports and data sources that may be of interest to you all. The Injury and Violence Prevention Branch at the Division of Public Health has an injury-free NC poisoning data page that contains all of our po poisoning-related products, which includes the monthly emergency department data report, some fact sheets, as well as a link to the action plan dashboard. So I know we've condensed a lot of information in a very short period of time, and we generally hope to provide some context of the opioid epidemic in North Carolina, what the state is currently doing, and what resources are available to you. So I wanted to leave you with, North Carolina has achieved some success, but we have more work to do, and overdose death is preventable.
Thank you. We'd like to hear from you what sort of questions you have, and they could be very specific about a particular drug, specific health-related questions about how to identify or respond to an overdose, or broad policy-based questions. I mean, anything is fair game. So just raise your hand and I can call on you. I know sometimes that um, if like a mother who's carrying a child gives birth and they're like addicted to a substance, that the child would be born addicted. Do you use these kind of drugs to help them? Yeah, so we, um, a couple of things. So, so first of all, a child born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is a technical clinical term for that, um, there's a couple of different ways to to manage the health needs of that child. One is to to provide the child with um, very low dose. Uh, medications for addiction like um, methadone and, and slowly step them down. But actually in most cases more effective than that is just uh, low light, low sound and skin to skin contact um, with, with hopefully with mom, <laughs> right? So providing them a little bit more space um, when, when that kind of uh, care is made available, which can be harder to come by because hospitals are not known for being very calming places, right? And they can be very bright and they can be very loud. But when that sort of approach is allowed, um, it's typically children and go home much quicker, um, and uh, and it's. I think it's important to note that we have zero evidence that there are any long-term effects on the child, right? So so there's there's very very little evidence of any long-term um, consequences or risk for the child related specifically to opioid use. Sometimes opioid use coincides with other things like extreme poverty <laughs> that will yep. put a child at risk, um, but, but not the drugs themselves. Um, the other thing that I would say is that we, we try to um, step away a little bit from using words like addicted with young children because I, I think, especially for me, it's important to emphasize that um, addiction or substance use disorder is a behavioral disorder, and if you're two days old, you can't have a behavioral disorder. So the children can be born with um, an opioid uh, dependence, but but not with an actual addiction or use disorder. Um, and part of the reason why I, I mention that is because not all NAS cases are bad and unwanted cases. Um, as I mentioned, buprenorphine right now, which is an opiate, uh, or opioid, excuse me, I don't know if we have scientists in the room who just got mad at me when I said that, um, but uh, uh, it is an opioid. And that is the gold standard treatment for people who are pregnant and about to give birth. Um, it's really effective at like, helping people just stay level, um, keeping their body from fluctuating all over the place. Um, it helps you do your laundry. It helps you get to bed when you need to get to bed and get up when you need to get up and, and live a totally normal, happy, healthy life. Um, so when those parents give birth to a child who and they've been on buprenorphine, that child is going to have neonatal abstinence syndrome, but that is preferable. To many many other things right so um it's there there's treatments for it it does involve these some medications sometimes um but it's uh it's it's not the big deal that we make it out to be mm -hmm. provided the parent has help and i would build on that just to say you know you may have heard either in the media or just through talking to people in your own life you know anecdotal reports about um you know newborns that have been exposed to one or more substances and are having all these significant developmental disabilities or delays or whatnot that is, in the overwhelming majority of the cases, not due to the drug, but rather issues that happen along with the drug use. So if you think about someone who is, is pregnant and is using you know, cocaine or heroin or is using alcohol excessively, there's a whole lot of other things that are going on in their lives. You know? So they're probably not getting proper nutrition. They're almost certainly don't have access to proper prenatal care. Um, they're probably polydrug users, so they're you know, using nicotine and, and other drugs, alcohol perhaps, that we know, you know have deleterious developmental effects. Nicotine and alcohol, yeah. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> especially those two. Um, you know, there may be STD exposure. We know that certain types of STDs can cause developmental disabilities. So there's a, that's just a, a you know heavy metal exposure in the environment, high stress environments. There's a whole laundry list of things, and those things collectively tend to be what contributes to the um, negative developmental outcomes that we see in substance abuse kids. So when you think about a substance exposed infant or child the conversation that you really need to be having is really one of them effectively being sort of poverty babies. And I, that's not a great term to use, but I think you sort of generally understand what I mean by that, that it's not really a substance use issue. It's a broader socio-cultural framework within which the, the child's been developing. Yeah, it's also deeply traumatic to be a child or to be any person, but especially a child and see your family members go to jail all the time. Um, and I would, I would, uh, in my own opinion, um, that is a consequence of substance use that we have artificially created. 
right? There is nothing about using drugs that makes someone wake up in the morning and be like, jail sounds great, you know? So, so like that's something that our current way of dealing with, with substance use imposes upon families and can make things worse. If I could add the local perspective and the practice-based perspective of um, infants being born substance affected, um, there was federal regulation that came down last year called CAPTA that requires uh, a plan of safe care for infants um, who are born substance affected, which then also um, allows them to get into part of uh, the system of programs that allow for us to tackle some of those social determinants of health that you're hearing about where they're low income or um, poverty tends to be the biggest one. And so um, infants with a substance affected um, screen are then uh, alerted to, or we are alerted at both the social services piece and also public health. So then they are all automatically enrolled in um, care coordination for children um, to <coughs> those wraparound services. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is like relevant to opioids, opioids but uh, I have a friend who takes an antidepressant and they sometimes will wash it down with alcohol or drink like shortly after taking it and I'm not sure if I should tell them to stop that. I, I would encourage them to not do that. <laughs> um, and and, and the, the principal reason for that is, you know, and I, I don't want to try to get into specific interactions that may be occurring or may not be occurring, but I think the broader rule here is one of the things that we know about um, psychological disorders of pretty much all types, anything that, that would you know, sort of fall under the, the framework of typical clinical disorders, so anxiety disorders, mood disorders, thought disorders, eating disorders, all that kind of stuff, those things, as, as I think Jennifer mentioned earlier, without fail, all of them have a biological or genetic component to them, but those, those genetic components by themselves are not going to manifest the phenotype of the disorder. In other words, like just because you may carry a genetic set around with you, a set of genes that may predispose you to a certain disorder, that doesn't fate you to that. There are environmental triggers that be present as well to sort of set that process into motion. And one of the things that has become really clear over several decades of research is that psychoactive drugs of all stripes are really good at acting as those environmental triggers to set off pre-existing underlying genetic neurobiological stuff that you may be carrying around with you. Mm -hmm. So a, a, just a common rule of thumb is if, if you are dealing with a clinical disorder um, or you have a strong family history of those clinical disorders, I would stay away from the psychoactive drugs just like across the board, including alcohol. Um, so like some of you may have heard you know, there's been research over the years that's tried to link um, thought disorders to marijuana use. And, you know, a lot of you, I'm sure, know the phrase, like, correlation does not equal causation, right? It seems to be the case that it, it's not the case that, you know, smoking marijuana is going to cause you to have a psychotic episode, but rather folks that may be predisposed to those sorts of things may, first of all, be more likely than average to self-medicate using various drugs of abuse. Mm -hmm. And then if they self-medicate with those things, it's much more likely that exposure to those psychoactive drugs are gonna then trigger some of the underlying genetic or biological stuff and cause some sort of behavioral phenotype to manifest. Mm -hmm. So just broadly speaking, it's a very good general rule not to mix psychoactive drugs with, again, either a, a current or general fam familial history mm -hmm. of those kinds of disorders. Um, I would just add one thing to that, which is, um, you know, it's not all antidepressant, do you say antidepressant, is that right, or? Uh, okay. Well, I mean, a lot of different brain drugs are, are very, very different, um, yeah. and I'm, I'm on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors um, because I have anxiety disorder following acute PTSD, um, and that really helps me, speaking of long-term care, <laughs> care for things, it's, it's been working for a few years and it's not broke, so I'm not going to fix it. Um, but, uh, you know, my experience with that is that it makes me much more sensitive to alcohol um, to the point where I'm like, oh, I guess I'm calling an Uber now. Like, I had half of a beer, but I'm calling an Uber. Um, so, so that's something to sort of pay attention to, that there might be, like, it can change the way those things affect your body. Um, but I would also, I think it's worth putting an asterisk on everything that we've been talking about and going back to the whole, like, does tough love work for people with use disorders? Uh, the answer is still no, no matter what kind of use disorder we're talking about. Did any of you guys um, grow up in a place where you were given the D.A.R.E. program in high school? Did you learn to just say no? Yeah, okay. So, so that, 
most people in places of authority at the federal level strongly discourage school systems from using that program. All right. Um, part of the reason is data. Like you can look at data and be like, did it help? No. Did it make things worse? Sometimes, <laughs> you know. Um, but the other reason why it's just uh, why it's fundamentally challenging, and and again, we're getting back over into my corner of the sandbox, which is the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and how we make meaning with stuff. Um, the the idea that like you should like just say no. It means that the only thing that can protect you from harm is you, and then if you're not saying no, that's a personal problem. Right, you're not strong enough. You're stupid. You know, like something, something about you. And so, if someone doesn't say no, maybe even says yes or doesn't say anything and just does it, um, it's it can be embarrassing and and even make us feel shame to come up and be like, well, that thing that I was supposed to say no, I didn't say it. And now I'm in trouble. You know, like I took the car and went joyriding and now I have a flat. Uh, you know, so so we actually really discourage people from asking for help, um, which we have available, readily, effective help if we make them feel bad for pointing out that that's a problem. So I always try to emphasize the importance of uh, telling people that they're cared about, telling people that we're concerned about their safety, um, and telling people that they're loved. Because as a culture, we're really comfortable pe treating people who use drugs like crap. And that is profoundly unhelpful. Yeah. So. I, I know we just have a couple minutes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I went to the D.A.R.E. program in the 80s. And, oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It, was, uh, it, really, it really excited me to see all the great effects that you could have. I was like, wow, you get to see hallucinate on this thing. It was really you know, perverse effects. Like, You're not the only person I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. You're like nine-year-old. So, uh, <laughs> so um, just to wrap it up, I don't think we touched on uh, a lot about fentanyl. And so uh, a lot of what I've just seen is that and there was an effort to stamp out uh, the pill mills, especially in Florida. That heroin kind of popped up, and uh, the, the increase in the frequency and availability. And then I, it seems like there's a kind of crackdown on heroin, and then the fentanyl seems to have, have, have kind of taken that, that has substituted. Um, is that what you're seeing in North Carolina? We've been tracking and monitoring the epidemic for about 10 years now, and, and there clearly has been transition in some of these things, but it hasn't been one for one, so that's one thing that happens. I mean, I think there's a thought that sometimes if you're taking a prescription opioid and all of a sudden your supply is cut off, then all of a sudden you just jump straight to these other things. It does happen in some cases, but not all. And, um, you know, honestly, the, the, the traffickers and, and some of the other markets have just been faster and better at getting their products out, quite literally. Mm -hmm. And so when there's been shifts and there's been suppression in some areas, <laughs> In these other areas, it's, it's kind of like whack-a-mole, you know, you just kind of pound down and all of a sudden it comes up, which is why I mean, you, we need more comprehensive kind of things to deal with kind of poly drug substance issues and also kind of underlying things in terms of like ACEs, like adverse childhood events, like why exactly are people, you know, doing what they do? And so, you know, a lot of these things are have underlying traumatic kind of things for, for people who are, who are doing them in some ways. And so that's mostly the case. I think the fentanyl thing is just this incredibly kind of I mean, I think 20 years from now, when we look back on this, it'll, it just was a product that was introduced at a very unique time specific to this, to this episode. And, you know, and, and people aren't, again, half of the many users, at least now they do, but when it was first introduced, didn't know that they were, what product they were getting. And so there was a lot of people who, even people who've been using heroin for years, their supply changed. And that supply just had this really um, negative outcome in terms of the overdoses they were experiencing. And, and sometimes their dealer didn't know. Like, it, it's, it's a very kind of complex web. So the fentanyl thing has been, and again, now it's a little bit, uh, as not under, under control is the very wrong word, but I think there's way more awareness about it. You get a lot of people who are very clear about when they use, they don't use alone. Um, you know, they test for their product a little bit. They do test shots. There's a lot of stuff that lots of people have done to try to, Make sure that they stay safe and don't die. Uh, I was just curious if any of you were aware of like the process that went into creating the drug naloxone. 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 Like the process that went into it, because it seems like a pretty significant drug in its effects. Wasn't it the Germans? Yeah. It's usually the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> European. I don't know which, but yeah, European started in Europe. Yeah. 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 But you said it's been around for a while, it's only now. It's been around for a long time. Yeah, it's been around for decades as a research tool. And I, and I don't know if 
if this is true for this particular drug, but oftentimes these kinds of drugs are initially developed as research tools, you know, so we're generally interested in, so the opiate system, for example, well, you'd want to have some sort of compound that strongly blocks that so you can then animals do certain research studies. And a lot of these kind of, particularly these very strong antagonist drugs were initially developed purely as research tools. And someone said like, hey, there's an obvious public health application for these things, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And I think, if I can add one quick thing on that, I think with the, with the naloxone, the biggest change has been, like, EMS has been carrying it for decades, right? The biggest change is that their community members, family members, and others who are kind of non-professional medical people who, who basically can do it. And it's simple. And again, it's, it's, it's fairly risk-free. There's no adverse events. And so the, the biggest shift in that has just been, like, anyone, brother, uncle, aunt, uh, you know, can carry it and can save someone's life. Whereas in the past, it was kind of restricted to, to medical personnel. Your local health department has a standing order for naloxone as well. That's it's right. available um, in some local health departments and through the state health director's um, standing order. And, and what is it, 1,600 pharmacies in North Carolina you can walk into and basically access. Again, not for free there, but, you know, you can get it if you need it. It, or you should be able to get it if you need it. And in addition, um, if EMS comes out and we reverse somebody that overdosed on an opioid or an opiate, uh, we leave a kit uh, with some information as well um, with everybody, and that kit's free of charge. Um, I was wondering if there was like a common quality, like regarding treatment of like opioid over overdoses, of people who don't relapse. So like people who are gone or people who are like done with using for good. Is there anything that's like kind of like a common denominator? Um, so you're saying people that kind of like walk away cold turkey from stuff? Not exactly. Like, what's the most effective, like, through research and like mm -hmm. precedent? Is there anything that like has really helped people? Like, so I think I, I think I get your question, and I might I would suggest that the reality is actually kind of the reverse of that, in that we have more understanding of the indicators that lead someone to not be able to do that than to do that. Um, there is similar to the study that I put up uh, above where we like asked you know tens of thousands of people have you used heroin in the last year have you had an opioid use disorder in the last year and kind of compare those numbers we also know that like a ton of people report having some kind of substance use disorder at some point in their lives and very few of them ever access treatment right a lot of people quit smoking with ever, without ever buying the gum buying the patch using the prescription whatever you know like that that is a thing that happens and in fact that's usually the norm and the people who struggle to get out of that, uh, the, that symptomatic place are typically in the minority, and it's those people who desperately need access to these kind of support services and treatment. Um, and, and this has been really similar to my experience with post-traumatic stress disorder, because like, if something happens that's awful, like we all are in a state, like we're gonna be going through something for a little bit and have lots, like our symptoms are gonna be really, really similar. Um, but the vast majority of people self-resolve <laughs> through that for whatever, like may maybe your brain is just really on point, maybe you've got really good social support, like who knows. But there is this minority of people, like yours truly, who just like don't do that and don't process through it. And there's a better understanding of why I'm a statistical weirdo than why everyone else is fine. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you um, briefly talk about like the risk of cocaine being like laced with opioids, like fentanyl, and the implications that would have on a college campus? No, it's good. Um, everyone's looking at me. Okay. <laughs> well, because you you know the stats more than I do about you know how how frequently yeah. you're likely to find something like that. Well, um, so. Here's a couple of things that I know, and I would, I would asterisk all this and say we're still actively learning, right? We do not, okay, we know for a fact that fentanyl is showing up in cocaine. We know for a fact that some people are overdosing because they are taking drugs that where opioids have no business being in them, yet there are opioids in them, right? We know for a fact that some drugs are being sold as counterfeit. So not cocaine necessarily, but like, um, it, you, can, you can Google this, there was a fake Percocet, I think, yellow bar being sold in Macon, mm -hmm. uh, Georgia a couple years ago. And like, you can literally buy pill presses on Amazon that look like kind of like a hinky version of a Zanny bar or a Percocet or whatever you're doing. And you can like put together like arrowroot powder and maltodextrin and then like whatever you want to throw in there and make a pill and then find someone who's willing to pay 30 bucks for that pill. So actual counterfeit stuff, we know that's happening. Um, and, um, and we also know that it's possible to detect fentanyl in drugs, not the amount of it, but just the sheer yes or no presence, because there is now a technology that's more and more available. You can get it from Indian Exchange. 
uh, <laughs> called fentanyl test strips. And it's basically like litmus paper, but for fentanyl. Um, it's not the most intuitive thing to use. It's the opposite of a pregnancy test. So like two lines good, one line awkward. Um, but but y'all are smart and you can figure it out. But you need to be trained how to use it. Um, it's not, like I said, it's not the most intuitive things out of the box, but it's really helpful. And that has helped some people identify fentanyl in drugs that it would never have otherwise been in. What we don't know is why fentanyl is ending up in cocaine, right? We don't know consistently if it's being sold as cocaine and there just happens to be fentanyl in it. We don't know if it's being sold as a speedball, sold as a product that has both the drugs in it. We don't know if the people selling it know it's in there. We don't know if it's placed deliberately in there or if like people in their work sheds are just really bad chemists. Um, some of the sort of like mid-level processing places where like, like if you um, ever read about like major drug busts in the paper where there's some like mid-level supplier, that's often a place where they'll have like 10 Vitamix blenders going on the counter, like cutting things and mixing them together. Um, and so, I, I don't know, dust flies in the air. So like, the, the, oh, and I've definitely worked as a barista and made a Thai iced tea with salt instead of sugar before. That has happened to me. So, so this could all be accidental. We actually don't really know. So the provenance of it is hard to understand. Um, and we also don't really know how one person's supplier could put you at risk or not. Um, I have, not in North Carolina, but in Rhode Island, I've done a lot of work with people who are buying and selling and using drugs with from each other. Um, and a lot of the time, the person that they were buying it from was their risk factor or their risk protection, right? So if someone, like if the person that you were buying your heroin from is like Jimmy, who you who you've known since the fourth grade, which in a place like Rhode Island, which is tiny and no one ever moves out of, is very likely, then, and that person doesn't want to sell fentanyl and that person doesn't want you to die, they're actually going to be part of your protection. But someone else could be. so. We just don't know. It's entirely possible that folks at Elon exist in like a socioeconomic strata where you're kind of protected from that. But it's also possible that whoever is supplying campus has a bad batch that there's. I mean, so it just there's a lot of things that we don't really know, but we know that it's there, which is why I always tell people like it's not a sure thing. But if something goes hinky and someone is in crisis, keep that in the back of your mind. So we're about out of time, and I just want to say one thing really quick to sort of finish up today. I would like to encourage all of you as you go out into the world and you encounter folks that have various substance use disorders, whether it's an opiate disorder or alcohol or nicotine or any of these other things, please do your best to, to treat these individuals with, with compassion and respect. Um, because what we're fundamentally talking about here is a biological disorder that these people are dealing with. This is not a moral failing. You know, it's not like they got up one day and decided, oh, I'm going to be this terrible person. I'm going to be a drug addict. Quite the opposite. You know, they don't have control of their own biology at this point. Mm -hmm. And I assume that none of you, you know, if you had a roommate or a friend on this campus who catches the Elon plague or catches strep or whatever, because it's going to be that time of the year, <laughs> you wouldn't say to that person, well, you know, it, it's, it's your fault that, you know, you were around other people that were contagious and you shouldn't go to the health center. No, no, of course, we would say you need to go and talk to a medical professional and get proper medical treatment for that biological disorder that you're experiencing. Okay. And there is no difference between those, you know, viral or bacterial caused communicable diseases and the kinds of things that we're talking about. It's fundamentally a biological condition so I would I would ask you to please keep that in mind and try to be as compassionate as you can when you interact with these folks because they oftentimes really really need that